Welcome to the Spiritual Underground Podcast. Uh, this is Dan again at the DTM Enterprises, the wood shop here at the, at the, at the compound. Uh, we have a special guest for you today. Uh, Brandon is here with us in the studio. He's going to tell us his story or we're going to have a talk. We'll see where the talk goes and I'm sure some of his story and uh, his path to recovery uh, will, will be, will be uh, talked about today. Uh, one thing I do know about Brandon, and this is a story that I've learned from the very beginning, because he and I, once again, uh, we kind of have this sponsorship lineage thing, if you haven't caught on by the podcast by now, um, that uh, Brandon and I share sponsors, and uh, I think you're actually one of the oldest, like, continuously sobriety pe- sober, sober people around here in this area, under Christopher, or uh, yeah, with him. Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, Close and, to and it. you are the original juice man. That's what <laughs> I was getting at. Uh, I've heard yeah. about that story from the time that I met uh, Christopher, and, and he started sponsoring me, so I, I, I know some of the stories and some of how that came about. Uh, if you haven't heard so far, and you look on the website and you see the, the juice stuff, the signs, and the, and you hear us say juice a lot, uh, that is our, I guess, for lack of, well, the best way I can tell it is like our life force energy thing where we have, mm-hmm. uh, you know, somebody right. some, somebody shares something really cool and we all say juice. Or you say, man, that was a juicy story. Or so we'll just use a, a word, trying to find a, it was a word that was handed to me that described this indescribable feeling that I get by uh, participating in this way of life. So welcome aboard. Yes, thank you. Um, Glad to be here. Well, let's just start off. Uh, I always like to have a guy start off telling telling his state and his sobriety date. As we said beforehand, I think that's a very important date. If you don't have a sobriety date, you don't have much. Right. Uh, and yeah. if uh, we said, you know, uh, heard a guy the other night who didn't have a sobriety date or he he wasn't really committed to it yet, and uh, that tells volumes about where he is in his recovery. Because if you're not committed to that 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 sobriety date it's a damn good chance that's not your last one <laughs> yeah yeah sounds, so we'll start like there. a reservation to me yeah so what is it uh so my sobriety date uh is february uh one february 1st of 2003 2003 and that is not my original sobriety date that's, that's my second one. that's my that's my current one but it's my second one my first one was uh, three months prior to that, November 1st of 2002. Um, there's a story there, of course, you know, yeah. but I had to add three months because I, you know, back in the day during my first year, <clears throat> I uh, <clears throat> was coming to the meetings and, you know, I think the, for the first four months, I was just coming to meetings, appeasing the courts, getting my meeting sheet signed, being a seat warmer, using it as an, ex- an excuse to get out of you know get out of the house i was on home incarceration at the time as well, well yeah. so i really hadn't like that guy like you talked about not committing to sobriety i really hadn't committed to this deal yet but i had certainly committed to getting out of the house and going to these aa meetings because that was a way for me to get outside of the you know out of the house for a few hours so um so i was doing that and somewhere in there uh i was only on home incarceration i think for three months only only yeah well they wanted to put me in jail for a year and then my attorney had negotiated that down to a six month um you mind saying what it was for yeah for duis duis it's like three then my third dui i was 20 i got sober at 20 i'm 41 now i got sober at 25 uh, and i picked up my first dui one week before my 21st birthday so that'll have you celebrating 16, 16 in just a few years, days in a couple, a couple weeks. of weeks yeah um so I picked up my first DUI, you know, one week before I turned 21, and then I had two more in succession over the next, like, two or three years, you know. So they were pretty back-to-back. I was spiraling downward pretty fast. Um, so long story short, you know, I ended up <clears throat> going on home incarceration, and, and um, three months three months of that, I had peased the courts and jumped through all their hoops and, and got off. Well, since I hadn't got a sponsor yet, I was going to meetings, I hadn't got a sponsor, so I obviously hadn't worked any steps, hadn't read the book, hadn't done anything that's actual program related. Besides um, coming to me, and I came to my head, you know, I was like, it's a, it's, I, I can, I can get, I can smoke a joint, you know, to celebrate, you know, the fact that I've quit drinking for the last three months, and I've, you know, uh, <laughs> were they testing you while you was on home incarceration? Were they testing me? No, they weren't. Was the threat of a test there? There, there was a threat there, yeah. Or but, a, but no, they. 
I was low on the priority list. Yeah. Low risk. Well, because I don't come from like you know the yeah. the slums. I didn't have a huge criminal background. You know, just my such. I'm middle class, if yep. anything. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah, oh, I know. So I, I think when they kind of showed up, I think I was probably a breath of fresh air. Like, oh god, a case file we don't have to worry about. Yeah, some little suburb kid. You know, got party too hard and you know he's not going to be a problem let's worry about somebody else right you yeah. know so they i've just a forgotten case really um my point there was is if it was or did you not smoke any because of that risk uh, while you were on home incarceration oh or, well yeah 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 and that because you said you decided to celebrate at the end of it well yeah cause I mean, it's the same old thing like i would get into trouble you know I, my drinking you know would get me into some sort of snafu you know with a person a relationship a job you know a ticket a court you know some sort of an appearance a court date i and i would inevitably always feel pressure you know like oh god i've done something wrong i got to shape up and i would muster some strength or some self-will and and uh you know and to try to keep myself clean for a while and i could successfully do that for a while you know and get into where i convinced myself that i was you know okay you know that okay now i can let off the the brakes a little bit and you know coast back into what i want to do which was always to get drunk or to get high you know um change the state of my normal condition and um you know that's what i would do you know i mean because I, I started drinking at 15 alcoholically you know i think i tasted alcohol prior to that but it hadn't it didn't really like click for me i think that was back in middle school i tasted it for the very first time a cap full or two of something out of the mom's liquor cabinet somewhere and you know i was too young i didn't totally grossed out by it yeah it's but it's somewhere my sophomore <laughs> year yeah and it was still even horrible when i first tried it sophomore year but for some reason i was i don't know older it did something better for me I, sophomore year and that's when i discovered alcohol and uh man I mean, I was never the same since, you know, uh, ever since that day. I mean, I literally got drunk that very first day and, you know, would seek that every other time, you know. Like, there was no – it was just on and off. There was no in-between. There was never any plan to moderate. There was never any thought process ever, uh, any real ra- romantic scenes in my mind or any of you know, these imageries that you see when you drive down the road like that was not me like i think maybe somewhere in my mind i thought that was me but like internally like really in the gut part of me no that's not me like, i wanted to just drink as much as i could until i couldn't drink anymore yeah i don't know where it came from i don't know why it was there it's just the way it was always it's always been when it comes to alcohol um you know so yeah yeah i really got this thing i'm a true alcoholic yeah. <laughs> um were you able to stay out how'd, how'd you do grade wise i mean what did you how'd you do okay. school well i guess since we're kind of sticking here i'll start there well, um, you can go anywhere you want to go man but yeah uh, well no so all the way up until so i guess i'll give you a little background so i grew up as a only child from a single parent my mother raised me by oh. herself um largely because she was a baby having a baby she was 17 when she got pregnant with me and delivered me and uh my dad who was an alcoholic at that time and i think on drugs as well and his dad you know my grandfather on that side also was an alcoholic so i come from you know so it's in the gene pool on the dad side for sure um so things were not good at the start of my conception (laughs) between my mom and my dad and my mom god bless her was strong enough you know which kind of tells a testament of how how strong she is at 17 you know was strong enough to realize that my dad jeff was not going to be a good influence for me or for her for us moving forward and instead of like what a lot of 17 year olds would want to do like rebel against the baby that she's about to have with his father who's not likely going to be in the picture or should be in the picture instead of like turning against that or turning against the baby that she you know and getting resentful i mean she went the other way she went 100 percent. it's me and this kid because she didn't even have a whole lot of support from her own mother and her own father um who should be in her corner because they were kind of that old school mentality. You made your bed. You need to lie in it. You need to marry Jeff and move on and, you know, take take it on the chin. They, they were that type, you know. Yeah. And um, my mom was not about that. You know, she was like, nope. 
that's not good advice. I don't like your advice either. So the hell with you too. And so she left home and stayed with girlfriends for a while, I guess. And completely at 17, this is 40 years ago, 17 year old woman pregnant, you know, not, you don't have the kind of support we have today. We don't have the kind of, um, I don't know the, it's, it's not it's not in the you know the the it's not in the public eye like this this issue you I mean, know, it's pretty young. regular now yeah it's I mean, pretty regular it, now yeah. but at 40 i mean think yeah. rewind 40 years ago this stuff that was stuff was still yeah. taboo yeah. really yeah. and yeah, so that's what i'm saying my mom's a married, strong yeah. ass woman she was she was she was she's dope <laughs> yeah. um to be at 17 and to have that kind of wherewithal it tells you how much she loved me and how much she really could not wait to have me come and be a part of her life you know and that's that's the way that she's always talked to me you know growing up um she always was very you know adamant about her love for me and about how how wanted i was and so i grew up you know probably different than a lot of alcoholic stories like there's not a lot of abuse there's no sexual misconduct in there there's no real down and out kind of stuff you know i mean i grew up with a single mom who i mean just loved the crap out of me and i really truly didn't feel a whole lot of loss i mean even there was still some loss on the dad's on the dad topic just inevitably you know yep. um and she made up for a lot of it but there was still just some loss there and um i had a lot of and that caused some pain that caused some doubt and that caused a lot of um yeah, you know, just unknowing, just un, that's just un, I was just unsure, you know, I was unsure how to to be a man because I didn't really have a good example. There was one example that I did have, uh, and that was my mom's dad, my grandfather on her side, and I would say between he really was like my father figure, but of course he was a grandfather too, so that's kind of where I get some of my old school mentality and my old school kind of thinking because. I mean, he was a he was a depression era kid. You know, he was born in 1930, and so I've got my mom raising me, who is obviously very you know responsible, uh, and then I got my granddad, who's you know very uh, pinch penny miserly kind of sarc. You know, um, grandpa still around? No, nah, he passed. He passed uh, during that first year and a half that I got sober. Um, which I was grateful that I was sober when it when it happened because I got to be present and to be there. Um, it just I have to, that's about the only thing in my life that I really have regret about that he's that he passed sooner than I'd like you know I'd like to him to see how it turned out you know deeper in sobriety because I got married and had kids and you know he never got to see uh, my you know his grand his two grandbabies which I would have loved to you know have shared watch how he him. interacted with him yeah. he was just he was a really neat guy I mean he was a he was a real you know hard ass you know um he'd tell it like it is and um and at one time i just thought he was just a real pessimistic son of a bitch really you know um but that was, that was when i was a teenager and of course anybody that kind of acted like that as a teenager you know was an authoritative figure and you know i'd push him away a little bit but then as i got in my 20s i started getting into trouble and realizing that life's harder than i thought it was going to be a lot of the stuff he said like, made a lot of sense you yeah. know yeah. same thing from right mom. all along yeah you, you know this happens I, I hear that happens with kids so it kind of leaves me a little hope for my own <laughs> that at, at some point they return to sanity but um <clears throat> So anyway, um, so that's what I, so I kind of grew up, you know, in a very, what I would probably call pretty stable, you know, stable with some, in some chances of instability, you know. Um, so growing up all the way up until high school, we moved around quite a bit, you know, um, started out in Columbus, Indiana, but, you know, there was just lots of moves, you know, to, from, you know, Columbus to, to Louisville and then back to Southern Indiana and a couple places in Southern Indiana. So all between... I don't know, grade school and up to high school, there was probably five or six moves, I want to say. It's kind of hard to make and keep, you know, yeah. friends, you know, especially when you don't have any brothers and sisters, you know. Um, so that didn't really help matters much. But somewhere around the fifth grade, we landed in Clarksville, Indiana, and I ended up uh, uh, becoming really good buddies with this, this one friend of mine named Mike. And we – really from the day we met we were really inseparable so from like fifth grade till our senior year 
I mean, every day we were kicking and hanging and I was at his house or he was at mine, you know, staying the night, you know, he was like an adoptive brother to me yeah. and I was one of his, you know, his family as well. And I used to love going to his house. He, he, his house was chaotic and I loved his house because my house was so quiet, you know, oh, yeah. just me and mom. If something didn't go right or if I didn't do the chores, it was glaringly obvious I didn't do what I was supposed to do, you know, yeah. but at his house, everything was so jumbled up and mixed up and crazy because he had uh, two sisters and a brother and a mom and a dad and pets galore and birds running around i mean pet mice and rats i mean it was just nuts you know <laughs> and i i liked that crazy environment because it was just so different for my household and he always liked my household because it was so quiet, quiet. you know so we worked really well together but we were inseparable and he was he was my best buddy you know um and we still chat today. Really? Um, but I cool. ended up doing him wrong. You know, my oh, alcoholism yeah. ended up, you know, threatening that relationship too. But so that was leading up, so, so leading up to, you know, my drinking. Pretty normal childhood. The only thing that was really nagging at me was, you know, just this fear of not knowing how to be a man, fear of not knowing how to proceed with life. And after high school, I was really scared about a lot of that stuff, apprehensive. You know, I didn't have a plan, you know. I just didn't know. You know, I felt largely ill-equipped and i felt largely um you know i just wasn't comfortable being who i who i was truthfully i don't think i really knew who i was you know i didn't have you know a spiritual life like i have today i didn't have religion i didn't have all i have is my friends you know and then i discovered <clears throat> you know and then i discovered drinking was that common denominator that so far everybody that i that sit here anyway and then others are here mm -hmm. is that whole deal about having trouble you know not feeling like they're a part of having trouble fitting in yeah yeah i always felt that you know i felt that in my own family like you know like my granddad's side of the family remember when i go see like just i just i just always would feel like i don't belong yep. you know and the only place that i and i belonged you know with my buddy mike i mean he i always felt like you know right you know okay there in at home with my mom but then even you know, during the high school years i felt a, you know drifting apart even from her just because i think some of that's natural you know a teenager yeah, and their right. parents drift you know um but i also think you know once i discovered drinking i knew what her stance would be on it she would not be for it <laughs> because we had already had you know, when you're when you reach that age, that that topic comes up. You know, it just it's part of it's just part of the. It's vernacular. inevitable, and if you don't talk yeah. about it, you're actually dodging. You know, it's, it's the the elephant in the room kind of thing. You gotta. Yeah, and, and she I would was suspect always suspect probably. I don't know. I'm gonna guess maybe that she had some idea about this genetic. Act oh, she did, and that's and that's how she would speak. Your to me father. About it. <laughs> yeah, and that's how she would speak to me about it. You know, she would she would warn me. You know, she basically would. You know. Uh, this is before any incidents came to mind, you know, like any, anything that I, this is before I even really drank, you know, she would talk to me and prep and she was preparing me for what she believed, I guess probably was the inevitable, you know, that my son's probably going to drink and he needs to be aware that he's got this family line, you know? Um, yeah. It's only fair. It's really, I mean, yeah. to, to not address that would be a travesty. It really would be something that. And so she, and she did her best. She really did. I had to hand it to her. I mean, she, she kept it an open topic. I never felt like I was in trouble. It just felt like she was giving me information, you know. Um, and I, re I remember the very first time, I think, that, she, that I got caught by her, that she found out of my drinking. I don't remember. Um, well, I remember, I, I remember pieces of it, I guess. I remember the plan was it was after high school you know it was after you know school one day and then i was in high school sophomore plan was me you know mike was supposed to come over to my, my house we were going to drink uh you know drink a little bit and then he was going to stay the night <clears throat> that was the plan you know not really any different than any other night because like i said you know we were really inseparable you know from fifth grade on he always stayed over and it was no no problem and um so here's so I woke up, all right. So the night happened. I remember waking up, and it was about five thirty in the evening. I didn't realize a whole nother day had happened. Okay, I wake up at five thirty. I was up in my bed. I come downstairs, and Mike and my mother are sitting at the table. Well, this is a normal scene because my mom gets off work around four thirty or five, so she would be home around five thirty. And in my mind, Mike's still staying the night. You know. 
it's not uncommon. You know, he, he should be here too, right? Why did I, I must have taken a nap. I come downstairs, you know, <laughs> they're sitting at the table. They look up at me coming down the stairs and they just both have this dumbfounded white ghostly look on their face like, you know, and I, and I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, why are they looking at me like that? And, you know, of course, I'm still a little groggy and I'm, you know, I just woke up and I'm walking past them to go to the fridge to get a drink or something. And, of course, I'm thinking to myself, why are they looking at me like that? And then I turn back around and I look at them and they're still, you know, looking at me strangely. And I was like, and I actually asked them, I was like, why are you guys looking at me like that? And he said, you don't remember anything? And that's never good. You know, when they when, when somebody answers your question <laughs> with you don't remember anything kind of a question, that, that tells you something like, oh, crap, <laughs> I did something bad. And so I was like, um, I don't know what you mean or something to that effect. And then they started telling me. So basically, I got insanely drunk and had passed out upstairs um, in the spare bedroom on the floor and my mike and some of the people that we were hanging with didn't know what to do of course this is high school okay remind you this is high right, school. yeah you know inexperience <clears throat> they didn't know what to do they cleaned up all the mess of the alcohol you know any any evidence of alcohol and they left well they left me there right so mom comes home you know from work there was only like we got out of school like at 2 30 right i only lived a mile from the school but there was only about three hours of, of a window, you know, to drink like two fifths of some. I think I drank two fifths of vodka. Is what I think I drank. That's what they told me. That's what Mike told me the next day. And um, it was me and him and a couple of girls. I did most of the drinking though. That's so why I got plowed. So three hours later, she comes home. She finds me unresponsive. She can't wake me up. She's slapping me. She's doing everything. Well, she freaks, all right, because there's no drugs laying around. There's no alcohol laying around. There's no nothing. She just comes home and finds her boy unresponsive, flips out, calls 911. So I've – then I vague – and as they're telling me the story, it kind of kicks in. I was like, oh, yeah, that was the – I remember seeing policemen. I thought it was a dream, you know. Really? So it come. It started coming. It, it, only one little piece came to, and the only piece that came to was, "Ma'am, he's okay. He's just drunk," and that was it. I thought I dreamt that. Why I don't know, but you know. But what I come to find out is, I guess they were doing several things to wake me up or to arouse me, and I woke up just enough to, you know, I'm laying on the floor looking up at my ceiling fan, and there's. These shadowy figures, but one of them was, I guess they were EMS people, you know, and uh, they were telling, they were, and she was crying, my mom was crying, and that was all I remembered, you know, but it didn't, I didn't remember it until they started talking about it. Um, so that was an interesting, so that, so that really started a more in depth conversation about my family history and genealogy and all that stuff and about, yeah. you know, my alcoholism. So that was like the very first experience, that was sophomore year. And, um, didn't get any trouble. It was just more of a stern, you know, you need to be very aware of this. And, you know, and of course, like all alcoholic, true alcoholics, we take that as a sign of, you know, like, hey, okay, I, I fooled you, you know, like I, I, I won. I won that round, you know, and I never really listened to her, you know, about anything because even at that time, it was like one of the first few times that I'd been drinking. And even then, you couldn't have convinced me that I had a problem because I don't think I really did. You know, I mean, not like for real. You know, like I hadn't crossed the line yet. Right. And this uh, person drinking alcohol, period, was probably always going to be a problem. But at that time, there's no way you could have convinced me, yeah. like you know, that to stop. You know, um, just hadn't had enough. Just hadn't even really begun. So, so that you know, my the rest of my you know alcohol or my career, you know, through high school was. Just that, you know, just littered with drinking a lot. So my, you, I think you started this whole thing off earlier about grades. You asked one question, and we finally got to it. <laughs> you asked, you know, what my grades are like. So uh, up until sophomore year, I think all the way up to my freshman year, I was pretty, you know, pretty good grade kid. Like I had, I think a four point oh my freshman year. Uh, sophomore, I think it was a three five, and then junior year I almost failed. Uh. So it was, it was a rapid succession. Yeah, interesting. And then, then I had to work really. Like, the great question was really just to kind of, I saw you kind of stalling a little bit, like where <laughs> we go from here. So I thought, well, I'll throw something up just to get some words rolling again. And, and man, did it work. Mm -hmm. 
So, but that's interesting oh, that, that you uh, had that, uh, that that turn of events in your yeah, just that fast. <laughs> so yeah, I went from four oh three five to almost dropping, having to drop out. Um, had to work my ass off my junior year to just stay stay alive, and then uh, and even had to work you know really hard my senior year to also try to help you know bring up that GPA too. But I graduated. And then even spent some time, you know, going to college, you know, went to Indiana University Southeast for, I'd say, roughly about two years. But by that time, I was so, so far gone. Um, and there was a catalyst to all this. Like, so to my senior year of high school, so my buddy Mike, you know, um, he had a girlfriend and uh, I ended up, you know, sleeping with his girlfriend. I betrayed mm. our friendship. Um by sleeping with with his girl and not just once but a few times and lied some girlfriend she was huh right and then lied about it even when he found out and confronted me on it you know lied to his face for hours until finally i broke um you know and told the truth and you know it was just i was devastated inside you know i mean what what but the most interesting thing about all of that was i mean our he loved me so much that he was more because he was already having troubles with that relationship and he was more mad at me that i didn't like confess or let him know a lot sooner because he stayed in the relationship like six months longer than what he really should have you know and so he was more mad about that but he wanted to kind of like maintain a friendship and i my my head at that time with drinking and with all those isms and the character defects getting riled up and I couldn't, none of that, I couldn't account for that. None of that made sense, you know, and I didn't, I felt so shamed and I felt so, so bad that I had done that. I pushed him away. So I like hurt him again. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it took my sponsor pointing that piece out to me. Cause I never really noticed that until I got sober and got a sponsor. And he told me more truth about that experience that I shared with him, you know, that now you, you injured him a second time because he wanted to, he was willing to put that, put it you know put it past him and yep. uh and you ended up harming him again by telling him you know basically screw you you yeah. know i can't handle it which was interesting you know, it was like wow that's a double double shot there um so anyway so that event during my senior year really kind of sh- shook my foundation because like i said you know i didn't have you know um a whole lot of friends i just kind of had that one good best friend and i've destroyed that relationship and so i kind of i had but i had you know what i was like any other guy i call like you know i'm a good chameleon you know i had lots of i didn't really fit in like a certain clique you know i was just kind of the an average normal regular kid i didn't fit with i could fit anywhere you know and uh so i had all these other little circles of friends these are little pockets and sometimes they would overlap sometimes they wouldn't so whenever that friendship with him, you know, ended, I started hanging out with these other fringe groups. And uh, that's when my drinking, you know, kind of went to a different level, you know, and, and worse level. Because these people were more of the reject crowd, I guess you could say. And so, you know, reject behavior <laughs> or deviant behavior was more normal. And so... Um, so, you know, that was my life for a while. And so there was a fast progression, you know, again, from that point to, you know, um, to drink and the drug. And, of course, I wasn't a big drug head. I mean, I, I drank a lot. I mean, I was, drink is the only thing that really ever turned me on. I mean, I smoked pot a bunch, you know, but pills can never stomach and all that good stuff. I, I just, thankfully, you know, yeah. especially now with it being a freaking epidemic yep. like it is, right. you know, um, I just could never stomach those things but drinking was just always there um so yeah kind of you talk about the friends getting and i don't want to i don't like to put people in a class or anything but you said something about like that uh and i can't remember what it was but i heard a guy talk about that their uh class of friends kept on getting lower and lower that's exactly dropping their uh lowering their standards yeah as the disease progressed mm-hmm. and uh because you want to be around people that are like you you don't want to be around somebody who you believe to be above you you know or that's better than you yeah. because then your behavior is going to stand out pretty bad yeah and you're going to feel icky yeah. you know you want to be with people that are like to gravitate towards people who like to right. drink at the same levels that i did you know yeah. they like to use the same substances i did and yep 
Uh, so I hung out at a lot of bars. I did most of my drinking at bars. Because at this time, let me just... Uh, so I'm not living on my own yet. You know, I'm still keeping a... I'm still living at mom's house. Never really moved out. Right? Yeah. So I'm 18 to... 20 some odd i don't know some of those you know i i was a i just stayed there of course i never was really there the only time i really came home was to sleep you know i always worked i always had a job i've, I've always had a pretty good work ethic and that was one thing that i've always been able to you know to to fuel my own fire <laughs> in the money category um and that was one of the pieces that i guess that i kind of used also help maintain some semblance or delusion that i was somewhat okay you yep. know is that i had you know that i had a job i certainly know. leaned on that the whole time you know mm-hmm. and i'll tell this story over and over you know a nice house two cars in a garage beautiful wife yeah. beautiful children had held a job for a long time i can't possibly have a problem right see exactly. all that stuff yeah see yeah. all that they haven't come and taken that I, stuff you can't have all that and have a problem i right. got a handle on this right exactly um and that's what and that is what is interesting you know like for me like i don't feel like i I just feel like I was just some young, immature, punk-ass kid who hadn't really lived enough life and gained or achieved anything to really lose a whole lot. You know what I mean? I just never really started because I kind of started drinking in the most the worst part of your formative years ever. From 15 to 25, that's an important decade, you know, to set off your life or to wreck it. Yeah. And... I just was basically on the brakes the whole time. I mean, that's really what alcoholism did for me. It just, I mean, I went backwards for sure, but I mean, I was certainly just stagnant, you know, and that's what, uh, that's what I hate the most, I guess. If I had, if I regret anything about my alcoholism, I said that I, that's really, you know, I lost 10 years of my life, you know, um, but I don't really regret it. You know what I mean? Because yep. they were valuable. It was still valuable. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That whole thing in the book about you know we don't regret the past. No. We wish to shut the door on it. And, it's hard to say that without saying s- that word though. It's yeah, I know, and I will. I'll got to label it somehow. I have some regrets. So just that's the that's the that's the fact of the matter. We were talking. I regret that I never learned to play an instrument. Yeah. <laughs> I regret that uh, I I didn't finish and get my Eagle Scout. Uh, I, you know, there's certain things that I just flat out I do. I, I wished I would have. I wish I'd have done it differently. Right. Yeah. So um, I don't know. So somewhere around. So I mean, the story remains. You know, it, like I said, I tried. I tried college for a while. I was just too much into partying. You know, I really wasn't trying to apply myself because honestly, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and I didn't really have a lot of guidance to really know to look beyond some of that stuff and just keep going. You know, but even if I'd gotten the best advice, you know, out there. I don't think it would have mattered because the, you know, that the beasts have been awoke, you know, I, 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 nothing was important to me. I just wanted to drink. I mean, relationships were there, but then they weren't there. You know, I could kind of take and leave those, you know, um, my MO typically was, you know, I would be, you know, in a relationship for a while, six, three to six months is about the longest. And then something would happen, you know, inevitably something, something would go wrong. And, um, and then I would, you know, be single again, and I'd give myself some time, six months or whatever, before I would try again. And I would just use that time to drink a whole lot, you know. And then even when I did get in a relationship, I would find somebody that drank a lot too or didn't mind or somebody I could snow or whatever, you know. But, but I know somewhere around uh, 20, my mom and I decided uh, she was tired of the job that she had, and she was wanting to buy a business and, and work it. And so, you know, and I've, and I've always kind of had an entrepreneurial spirit. And that's the one thing I could say about, you know, uh, my work ethic and whatnot is that I've always been kind of driven. You know, there's always been something that, that has driven me to want to that want more, you know. I wanted more in my <laughs> disease, you know, but I also wanted more, you know, in, out of life too. And so I feel like I've always been a driven person and, a, and you know, a seeker for – and I've always had like some like this internal picture of hope in my mind of, of that things are going to be okay, you know, and that I'll always be okay. And I don't know why that's there. I don't know where. Maybe from the love that my mom gave me when I was young. I don't know. Um, but I've always been a pretty upbeat guy, you know. My alcoholism is probably the worst, you know, time in my life as far as you know the low points and some of the depression that I felt. Um, but even through all of that, you know, my self will would kick in and it would you know tickle that that internal drive that was still there that hadn't completely died 
and you know i would rally you know i would find some other scheme or some other thing right well i've always had these jobs that were either eat what you kill types you know or you know sale you know sales environments things like that or run your own business kind of stuff and so um that's pretty much been my my mo you know now, I happen to think it has something to do with the fact that my grandfather told me you're never going to get rich when you work for somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that really stuck with me. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, because it's my, I've lived my whole life pretty much based on kind of that sentence. Well, there is some uh, validity. <laughs> there's to there's that some statement. validity to that. Um, and so, so we started a donut shop. All right. Huh? Neither one of us knew anything about donuts. All right. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Well, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know why. I, I don't know why either. You said it, donut shop. So we started a donut shop. Um, I guess you didn't know this story. Nope. So, I don't okay. Know this story. Right. So there was a guy in Louisville who's got a donut shop um, called Sugar and Spice. I don't think I'm getting in trouble for saying this stuff. I can't imagine. Yeah, Sugar and Spice Donut Shop. It's, on, it's still an operation. And you're not going to sling him under the bus in a minute, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No. Then he just got some free advertising. Yeah, if, uh, there you go. And they're around. really good donuts, by the way. Uh, you should go check him out sugar and spice donut shop but he was looking to uh franchise his business out and uh i guess had struggled for about five years to do it on his own he was doing it on his own and somehow he connected with some headhunter group that helps find people who are looking to buy businesses my mom was somehow connected to that boom 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 they connected and so now we're buying the very first franchise of sugar and spice donut shops, which by law trademark had to had to change its name to Sugar Bells. So we changed. So the name Sugar Bells Donut Shop opened up in Jeff on uh, Hamburg Pike, um, and uh, we were running that. So I was 20 years old. All right, and then, and there was a reason why I told the story because I was okay. You got to imagine. Okay, I'm I'm an alcoholic, young alcoholic who doesn't know he's an alcoholic. All right, who's got a pretty good ego on himself you know i I think pretty highly of 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 me at this time and (laughs) you know i'm fairly popular amongst my friends because i've always been a pretty charismatic guy you know um personable yeah you know and so at 20 years old my mom you know i feel like a celebrity because my mom and i you know decided to open this business right you know my friends weren't doing that shit you know, there wasn't nobody around, you know, us that was doing, making yeah, those kind of Opening up their own businesses. Yeah, and putting yourself out there like that, you know. And we had to work hard, you know. And, uh, and of course, and I'm doing this, you know, drunk a lot. And so mom's really getting, you know, a half measures guy, really. But she doesn't know it. Of course, I don't know that's what I'm giving her either. But essentially, that's what I'm giving her. And we still were able to keep it afloat for about three and a half years, you know. Um, but... So that scenario, you know, of, of but when here, here's what's even funny. All right. So the very first DUI that I told you about, I got, I was 20, I was a week before turning 21. I got arrested in the bank right next door to where we opened up our shop. The year, I think it was six months prior to us getting that location. I got arrested for a DUI right there, huh. right next door. I got out and pissed in the bank bushes. Is that what happened? That's exactly what happened. Yeah. I got I, at that time I was working at HH Gregg in the warehouse. This was prior to us getting the shop location, and you know we were still training and we were still getting all the ducks in a row. And we had picked out a location, but we hadn't got it all. It was all still coming together, you know, because it used to be a, a liquor store and it had to be renovated and all that. And so at the time I was working. So here's the transition, all right? So I'm working at HH Gregg in the warehouse, ten bucks an hour. That's my job. My mom's working her crappy job. It's not. It's a good job. She just doesn't like it. And we're secretly, you know, we're buying this business. It's not ready yet. So I decided to have. I challenge one of the, my my coworkers. You know, is talking crap about how he can outdrink me. And of course, at twenty, you know, that's yeah. a big deal. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? That's yeah. a badge of honor, chip on your shoulder type of challenge, right? And so, you know, I was like, all right, let's do this. And sadly to say, I got defeated. But the, his, the story is, I go to his apartment over in Jeffersonville, across town, down 10th Street, or no, down Allison Lane, and we're drinking. I think we got off around 8 or 9 o'clock, and uh, we're, getting, we're getting hammered. I mean, just hammered. I wake up at like 3 in the morning. It was just me and Justin. It was just the two of us, all right? I wake up at 3 in the morning. There's 40-some-odd people in his apartment, and I'm passed out 
in the middle of the floor, <laughs> drunk <laughs> off my ass, and the son of a bitch is kicking me in the stomach. And so I get up, and of course I'm confused. I'm dazed. I don't. I'm pissed because somebody's kicking me in the stomach. I feel like shit. And you know, I run out of the. I run out of his apartment, and I immediately run to my car. And of course, as I'm running to the car, I hear people around me. There's people outside. There's people inside. I mean, it's a freaking raging ass party. Same night? Did you Same night, drinking? yeah. Yeah, so I okay. lost. So this wasn't one of I did not out drink this cat. Yeah, this cat out drunk me or you know, whatever. He kept on going. Oh, God, people he kept over when you died. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I had to admit defeat. And uh, so I get in my car, but as I'm getting in my car, I hear people saying, oh, God, he's trying to drive, he's trying to drive. So I have no idea what has happened prior to. I just know this is the scene now. And I get in my car. They unsuccessfully got the keys away from me unsuccessfully unsuccessfully i get i back out as i'm backing out one of them opens the, my driver's door i knock him down because i didn't stop and then i peel off well a couple of them tried to chase me in their car to like try to stop me i guess they were trying to be cool they were trying to like do me a solid yeah but of course i didn't look see it that way i mean i didn't wake up in the best place yeah. you know you know i'm passed out drunk i'm getting kicked in the stomach yeah, to get out of there. and getting made fun of and getting laughed at and so yeah i'm next thing you know um and of course i hear a lot of this stuff from them the next day okay because i go to jail that night i hated them people telling me them stories oh, from yeah. what happened and boy you were funny last weekend or last night yeah. or you know do you remember what you did do you and you're Wait. going uh yeah no, i don't really remember what i did like, what, no feel would you remind me mm-hmm so, the, so really, I guess what happened is, which I found out the next day, is that they were trying to catch me. They were trying to get me to, to not drive because they knew that nothing good was going to happen to me. If yeah. I, you know, get wreck, kill, get arrested, whatever. And they were trying to prevent that. somebody else, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were trying to do the right thing. But, of course, you know, um, I didn't allow them. So they said that they stopped, they stopped, they stopped you know, following me after I – blew through the red light at highway 62 the 10th street and allison lane intersection that big four lane yep. deal they said that you know it was red uh, and i just completely blew through it at probably around 100 mile an hour because um, they said they were doing about 60 and i was leaving and they said so you had to be going pretty fast mm-hmm. and um they said so we stopped we didn't really kind of want to know what was going to happen to you you know we were kind of scared and rightfully so i can imagine you know um but somehow i got i didn't go much further i mean i went down the road and turned left and i was at that pnc bank you know or national city back then right there at new albany charlestown pike and um holman's lane or no um hamburg pike it was that that bank i got out I pulled in that bank because I went there a lot. You know, it was my bank. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, it was a comfortable place. And so I pulled in the parking lot. And this is like 3, 4 in the morning on a Sunday night, by the way. And I remember I had to piss, right? Because I just woke up a few minutes ago. I hadn't had a chance to piss or nothing, you know. Like, I'm yeah. getting kicked. I'm getting made fun of. I'm mad. Getting now I'm driving out of here. Yeah, I mean, you know, like. I'm going to stop at the bank and take I a I need week. to take a pit stop. It's like, yeah, I need to matter. regroup. The bank is closed and it's 3 in the morning. And so I get out and I piss. I get back in the car. You know, I'm looking at my phone. And I had two thoughts. I remember these two thoughts. I was like, I could go home, crash, crash out at mom's house. Or I could call the boys and see what else is going to and see what else is happening tonight. Well, I sit there and try to start, you know, calling some of the guys and texting. You know, I don't even know if texting was around back then. I think I was calling. Hell, two th- was was texting around in two thousand, early two thousand. I don't think so. Yeah. I think I got pager? my first cell phone. Was around. pager still there? Because I yeah. had a pager. I, I think I got my first cell phone <laughs> in about oh three, about the time my son was born, uh, and and we weren't texting then. At least I yeah. wasn't. I remember. I think it was just phone calls back then. But yeah. anyway. Um, I remember trying to make some phone calls, and then the next thing I know, I'm getting drug out of the car by a cop. You know, well, that story is, I guess I fell asleep. See, and I had one of those little, <laughs> yeah, I had one of those, those, so um, you really weren't making phone calls at the time. Well, was I was, out. You but I also then, passed back yeah. out and fell asleep <laughs> while my car was running, and it was, you know, January, because like I said, I, my birthday's in January, and I was a week before, so it was like early January, so it was a little cold. And 
So I had my car was running, you know, and I had a Honda, you know, a little Honda Civic, and I fell asleep with my foot on the accelerator. Luckily, it was in neutral. I had a stick shift, so it was in neutral. But my car is just over revving. <laughs> At four in the morning, three, four in the morning on a Sunday night, you know, headlights on. I'm the only one. I'm the only one for miles that you can see, let alone here at this point, right? So I wasn't hard to find, <laughs> and you know, so that's how I got my first DUI. These cops, you know, get me. They they somehow they got into the passenger door. I guess it wasn't unlocked or whatever. And they pinched me really hard. They they did that that pinch maneuver that they do on you. And I only know this the next because they hurt for fucking three days afterwards. <laughs> and I read in the police report oh, when I got it that that, that's, that was the maneuver they used to try to arouse me. And I, I couldn't figure out why my arm hurt so bad, but that's what it was. <laughs> Some bitches <laughs> pinched the shit out of me. Uh, and I come stumbling out, you know. And But, you know, here here's what's really interesting to me. All right, so I remember enough of that night that I remember the story that I told them. And I made all this up on the fly. And this is, I, I still got, it's still landed me in jail. But the fact that my mind quickly came up with a story as fast as it did, as I'm reading things, quick, you know, as quick as I was, as drunk as I was, was pretty astonishing to me. I thought, wow. I, mean, I was impressed myself, okay? So they told me, you know, they were asking me a question, well, what, what are you doing here tonight? And I was like, oh, what? Well, you know, of course, I'm looking around. I'm trying to figure out where am I because I know I was over at <laughs> Justin's apartment, which is across town. How did I end up yeah. here? What are you doing here? First thing I got to answer is where am I? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I knew <laughs> if I'd so asked that, that, that was going to be bad for me. And so I played it the other way. Of course, I actually knew where I was. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Braden, uh, what are you doing here? Well, my first question would be is where am I? <laughs> where is here? Yeah. But because I knew that area so well, <laughs> when I get out of the car, you know, and as I'm standing there, standing up, whatever, you know, and I'm, I'm seeing where I am and I'm seeing that it's different than where I started. And I'm seeing how bad this looks for me because I drove and I'm obviously I'm drunk. This is not cool. Um, and so I had to come up with something fast that maybe might get, get them, you know, a little leniency on me, you know, maybe get them looking the other way or, you know, maybe just get me, you know, I was looking for leniency really. And, uh, they said, well, where are you coming? You know, well, why, why are you, where are you coming from? And instead of saying, you know, my buddy's house across town, I said, well, my, and there was, a, there was some apartments right behind me. I said, my buddy lives in an apartment back here. We started drinking after work. I wake up, you know, I told parts of the truth. I wake up, you know, he's, I passed out apparently, you know, he, he got mad at me cause he thought I was hitting on his girl and he started beating me up and, uh, cause I had puke on me, you know, like I'm looking at myself, I got, puke, you know, I look like shit, you know, I'm like, he, he was beating me up and so I ran out. I didn't want to drink and drive. I know that's bad. And so I just parked up here in front of the bank I had front, to get away. and I, I'm calling my buddy. Like I remember I was trying to call my buddies. I said, I've called my buddies to come give me a ride because I know I can't drive. That's why I've been sitting here waiting on him to come get me. He's like, that's okay. We'll give you a ride. And uh, I thought it worked, right? I was like, oh, yes. My little lie worked. So, I mean, it's not a big deal. Like, I thought for me, that was like, I was on the, making some shit up on the fly, drunk as hell. you know. And I thought, that's pretty remarkable. <laughs> that just goes to show what the alcoholic mind can do when it wants to get out of trouble. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so I go downtown, you know, and they end up getting me for DUI. So it didn't matter. You know, I'm still getting it. Um, and on the paperwork, I'll never forget the uh, the cop had ri written something to the effect that, you know, sarcastic, young, punk-ass kid, something like that. Oh, yeah. You know, and that, Christopher tells that story. Christopher tells that as part of, you know, part of my story, you know. Cause that's really what it was, you know. I was just a young, punk-ass kid, man. I hadn't really grown up. But so that was um, – so that – but so fast-forwarding, you know, we had that business – you know, and I thought I was, you know, hot shit back then. You know, that didn't help my ego much. And um, making the donuts, making the donuts, and you know, and all that good stuff. But we ended up having to shut our doors, you know. And really, I thought I'd kind of because we had a plan, we had a whole plan of uh, opening up four more, you know, around. We were going to like go to Cordon and you know, go to these, um, what's the Floyd Knife Top of Greenville? What's that? Highlander Point. Highlander Point. We were going to put one there. You know, we had we had plans. Silver Creek. We were going to put one out there. We had other plans, uh, but those plans never really developed. And so, 
when we shut those doors, I went through a nine month, what I would call like probably like a nine month depression. I just didn't really know what direction to go, what to do. Um, I kind of thought that my job category was filled, you know, and then we shut our doors that was like back to the drawing board type of scenario. And I don't really remember today what I filled that nine months with. I know I didn't work. I don't think I was dating anybody. I think it was a pretty low point in my life. I think I contemplated suicide a couple of times, but never really could, you know, get there. Um, but was just there mentally, you know. I mean, I was in that just real low spot. Drinking. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know. So I think that might have been somewhere around 22 or 23. And then, I don't know, somehow I snapped out of it. I don't know what exactly happened. Ended up dating somebody, found somebody. That got me woke up a little bit. I don't know. But then I started this, uh, I know, like right before I got sober, I was working another job. It was a sales job. No, that's not true either. It's funny. I've forgotten some pieces of my story. It's been so while since I've, I've told it. I do. I use a line over and over again that if I had known I was going to keep track of this, if I was going to have to relay this story, I'd have kept better track. Right. Yeah. I would have done this a long time. I would have recorded this yeah. a long time ago. Um, yeah. I, okay. So I guess the job that I was working prior to... Um, Prior to getting sober, like I had another sales job. It's called H and L Associates. This is kind of where the story of juice comes. This is where the, the term oh, is juice comes. So I'll tell this one just yeah. because it comes. The That's juice, important. the juice word comes from this, this job. So I'm working this job. So I've had a couple of DUIs now, right? And uh, my dry, yeah, I had the driver. I had a, I had a driver's license. I was looking for a sales job. I was looking through the paper, whatever. I found this job. Is it called H and L Associates over there on 164 Sears Avenue? I don't know why I still remember the address to this day, but I do. It was right behind Trinity High School. It was an important job. I learned a lot of shit at that job, um, and it was a direct sales job. All right, in direct sales, you know, there's a company in the U.S. called DS Max, direct sales to the max, and it was coined by some entrepreneur guy that, you know. <sighs> basically the the merchant cards the people that come to your door knock and sell your cards you know back in the day you know buy buy this card for 50 bucks and you get four you know three four free oil changes you buy one and get one free that all that kind of stuff yeah. that was what he did or quill pins you know the quill pins i think that was largely started off as a direct sales you know from this ds max company so anyway they have a whole boiler room type pitch to get you to even work there right well i bought into it okay and and buying into it of course i was pretty good at you know using my mouth and fairly intelligent you know um i could put a pitch together you know and so what i so i worked this job and i was good at it like we would li literally canvas neighborhoods you know and go door to door it was a numbers game you know the law of averages was usually one in ten you, you could improve those odds you know if you but how, how well you use some of the, the techniques but generally even if you were dumb as, you know, a bag of hammers, you could get one in 10. Just meant, you know, if you wanted 10 sales, if, you, if they were 10 bucks a card, if you if you make 10 bucks a card and you want to make 100 bucks for the day, you got to get 10 yeses, which means you got to get to 100 houses. It's not just simple math. It's easy to do. And um, I was one of the top producers for my team, all right? So my, I have a teammate, right? So with the guy who hired me in, I become his team teammate, right? Well, he's my team leader, all right? So the team leader is obviously trying to assemble his team. So it's totally a pyramid type scheme, all right? He's trying to assemble his team to produce enough numbers to where he can get his own office and get his own satellite store somewhere in the U.S. That's the whole deal. Well, my team leader ended up getting his own satellite store and moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and I moved with him But before that. So this, so this crowd, if you can imagine, is pretty – pretty interesting crowd i mean we partied like crazy and i did a i did i think i did the majority of my drinking in my career during that year that i worked with those guys <laughs> i mean it was a lot of drinking um so it was a that was and this is this is the job that i took right after that nine month depression so i think it kind of filled a gap yeah like i was longing for 
just I don't know liveliness and camaraderie and just uh, a sense of belonging to something you know and that filled a lot of voids for me and so you know I jumped right in and I was good at it and we were successful and and um, was making money and having fun and you know and, and it was a good time and um, and I was like one of the only like only ones that of the whole company because most people who worked there they were you know interviewing like college graduates well I hadn't graduated college I was one of the few who had not finished college but I'm hanging with them so that made my ego feel pretty good you know um so anyway so this term juice okay so they had since it's a a sales organization they had all kinds of rallies and meets and acronyms and fun ways to look at things and you know they had all kinds of this kind you know these kinds of things sales meetings galore well, one of the terms that they used was juice, and they broke it down, J-U-I-C-E, that spells juice, right? And they used it for an acronym to say, join us in creating excitement. It was a term, <laughs> it was a term that they were join us in creating, creating excitement. excitement. Yeah, or enthusiasm. Okay. Some people would like to switch excitement sure, for enthusiasm, yeah, but they were using it as an acronym yeah. to help recruit <laughs> people, to help branded. recruit, you know, any any new people to to your team and i remember you know going to these sales rallies and it was so funny i mean we had a lot of fun but like somebody would be up there talking about a certain aspect of the sales pitch or whatever and at the end of it you know much like a danish person would say skull you know to, to, to somebody would say too you know like the guy who's giving the speech would say juice and then the whole crowd would chant and throw their hand up and do it in unison, juice. You know, and so it just became this mantra. Like it became this thing that people would do. And so I told that story to to Christopher. You know, back when I was first getting sober with him. You know, when he took me to the steps, God, 14, 15 years ago. I started with him a year or two in. Um, he heard that story. And then, of course, the nick and we were giving out nicknames back then, and so I got coined to be the Juice Man. And then we started using that term "juice" to describe kind of like what you were talking about earlier to describe the life force that we use in here, or anything that's positive or something that's just really super cool, you know. So we've kind of stolen that term from. That is super cool story, man. That yeah, is so, so we've far, stolen that term like this and whole podcast thing that we're doing here. Yeah, that story alone. <laughs> Uh, made this makes this whole thing worthwhile. That'll have to be a uh, the history of the juice. Yeah, term. that'll have to be a that'll have to be a show note on because I put together that website spiritualunderground.org right and uh, and I put some show notes on there. <laughs> Definitely, that is going to need to be a show note. I'll okay, take a note. Do that. Do that for sure. Cool. Very very cool. But man. Um, so yeah, so we we we've, we've we've borrowed it. We'll say sure and, uh, and have and have reworked it, and I think it it suits us just well and. And uh, I think we've made good use of it, but uh, so yeah, so we that's what we use the word juice for today. But um, <laughs> but it's a good cool. term, you know. It's and it's a good, it's a good, it's a good term. It means it means something positive. It's good stuff. But um, so anyway, I don't know. Um, so let's go. Uh, like like what what caused you to end up, you know? And and I don't, I certainly don't mean to steer things too much, but no, back to like uh, when you know the uh, bottom hit. You know, when whatever whatever caused you to say okay, or the things leading up to the thing is yeah, caused well, actually, you to say, yeah, okay, well, enough segue, enough, really. man. No, this is this is actually a perfect segue because it was at this job uh, where the bot, you know, where the the rubber kind of meet the road for me, you know, because um, I took this job because prior to that I'd had my last my third DUI prior to taking this you know this the sales job that where the juice term came the from. juice job yeah the juice the juice we'll call it the juice job. I was there for about a year, all right? Six months in Louisville, and then the other six months, it was in Memphis, Tennessee. You know, I relocated and helped my boss get his office going. But this whole time that I was working there, I didn't have a license. I, I remember, I think I started this story saying that I did, but I remember now that's not true. I didn't. I didn't have a license because I had gotten the, D, the third DUI. They yanked my license for a year. And I so I was so desperate. I, was, I forgot to tell this piece, too. I was so desperate to just get a job because it'd be in nine months, you know, not with no work. I found out who my bit team leader was going to be. I asked him where he lived. He said the Devonshire Apartments in Louisville. I said, "Do you have any vacancies? Do you have any apartments that are open next to you?" 
no shit. And he said, yeah, I think there's like two or three in my hallway. So I went there and I got a, an apartment right next to him. So you could get a ride to school. And so that I could get a ride to work every day. I was like, I'm your fucking Huckleberry. I'm, yeah. I'm coming with you. And of course, he loved it because he was like built in loyalty. You know? Yeah. yeah. This guy's sticking. I mean, I ain't got to worry about him. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so I was committed. So I mean, that's, when I want something, I'm getting it, you know? And that's just kind of how I've always been. Um, so I rode with him to work every day for that year, you know, became his right hand man. And, you know, he, you know, ascended the ranks and he got his own office in memphis i went down there but the whole time i'm working there didn't have a license but i've got this court case right i've got an attorney things get you know cogs in the wheel you know i'm jumping through their hoops uh not on home incarceration yet but i'm jumping through their hoops i'm going to am i going to alcohol classes yet no i'm not i'm not going to alcohol classes i'm drinking a lot no that's right none of that stuff came until after all this so I'm in Memphis. So while I'm in Memphis, I remember I've got this court date coming up um, to go and find out how all this is going to shake out, you know, um, about my last DUI. Well, so I come back, I drive back to Louisville that weekend, and I show up for, for court, and that's when they tell me that, you know, they really wanted me in jail, but my attorney got a, you know, uh, sentenced down to, you know, home incarceration. And they would not, and I tried to get them to, say, like, okay, great, let me do home incarceration. Well, let's do that in, you know, I freak, I forget what county Memphis, Tennessee is, so let's do it there. And I said, that's where my job is, that's where I'd like to do it. And they said, no, you don't understand, that doesn't work that way. You know, you need to do it here in Clark County, Indiana. I'm like, well, I can't, my job's in Memphis, yeah, Tennessee. That, that, that doesn't work. Yeah, and it's like, well, we don't care, sir. The, the court case that you have to settle is here. And, you know, Clark County, Indiana, you know, wants you to, to serve your home incarceration here because this is where the offense occurred. So I had to quit that job, you know, and that was a devastating blow because, like, I'd spent a whole year, you know, working my ass off to get to that decent level and built a lot of friendships and whatnot. And, uh, sound like it was fun, sound like it was lucrative. It was a lot of fun. It was lucrative, you know, and it was, you know, certain suiting me well. And, you know, so that's one thing that my drink, you know, my drinking behavior took from me, you know, <laughs> I got yep. to just piss that one away. So I had to give that up for three months to come back to Clarksville, Indiana. And I didn't have a house here. I didn't have any place to live here because, you know, I've had an apartment down there. And um, so the only address that was in Clark County, Indiana was my mom's. So I stayed in mom's basement and they had to come over and do a home inspection and all that. So here's, so th all of this happened the weekend of Halloween weekend of 2002 and I know this because one of the guys that I worked with at my job his wife worked at Jenny's Diner she was like a waitress or whatever Jenny's Diner there on Frankfurt Avenue and Jeff was going to be in town and a couple of other buddies from my Memphis Tennessee office was also going to be in town that weekend and we all decided that you know we're going to go out and have a couple of drinks to help celebrate you know me you know and because i told them look you know i think it was thursday or friday court date um i forgot what day it was now but i got the sentence you know that they were going to put me on home incarceration i had to turn myself in on monday and go get the ankle bracelet and all that so i knew i wasn't coming back so it was kind of a devastating weekend for me so a couple of them came into town and we decided to go out for a couple of drinks and of course in my mind i'm thinking okay i'm, I'm in a lot of trouble you know life's kind of sucking right now um I, and i even told the guys i look i just i just i can only have a couple of drinks you know i gotta keep it gotta keep gotta it cool. keep, keep it cool man and man i tell you every time i've told myself that or like that started out the night with that being the goal um it always ends very very badly it doesn't work out that it just never does that lie never seems to stay in a good spot <laughs> it always jumps around and bites you um so i go out you know so we go out to drinking and uh with the best intentions really try to just have a couple of drinks i got so sloppy that night i couldn't even walk like i literally was crawling to the front door of my mother's house in southern indiana um literally crawling up to the front door i i could i couldn't get the key to work <laughs> i couldn't get the key in the keyhole and luckily my buddy todd who had also came out with us who's not who didn't work with us was just a, a, a friend of mine 
who I'd also connected with that, that night. He wasn't as drunk as he got with us later, so he was more okay. He ended up helping me get the key in the door, but I got I still got so impatient. I kicked the door open, and it was a big door, the double side lights on both sides, and there's decorative shit in the foyer, and you know, and it swung open. It's again four in the morning Sunday. It swings open, hits some metal stand that's holding some glass vase and it comes crashing down and shatters <laughs> <laughs> oh freaking idiot and of course my mom wakes up and this is my mom's house with my stepdad because my mom's you know married this time and, and uh i go upstairs and just hit the bed and just pass out well my mom proceeds to read the riot act to my friend and you know he leaves and and um so basically so this is the night this is this is that was the last night i ever drank because the next morning i wake up at like two in the afternoon mind you okay it's it's late or you know late in the day and i come downstairs and uh Something was different. Mom wanted to talk to me, and she was pissed. And I could see that she was pissed. And this is really the first time that she's ever really showed me pissed like this, you know. And so I already kind of automatically knew something was different. Um, and so I just knew I just needed to kind of listen, you know, and didn't really say a whole lot and just kind of gave short answers whenever pointed to for a question, for an answer. But in a nutshell, I mean, she basically just told me that um, that my whole charade was over, you know, that if I was going to continue to live, you know, because she got kind of caught up. I'd kept a lot of stuff from her. I think she always knew something's not right with my son. I think my son's drinking a lot. But, like, all of my – all of my um, – arrest and whatnot i kept under wraps because i would use a buddy's address something like that so the attorney the courts and the attorneys would send things somewhere else and not my house so that way i could do it all on the down low you know and so i kept a lot of those things secret from her except for this last one you know i couldn't i could not hide home incarceration bracelet in a inspection from the home incarceration people from her um so she and finding that out she knew that there was a prior record that i'd hidden and so she got she got clued in that there was more to the story um and again you know she had kind of enabled me by not you know really kicking me to the curb a long long time ago but but anyway she basically had said that you know uh that if i was going to continue to drink like I had been or like I was if I was going to continue down that path that she was going to completely wash her hands with me and she was serious like I could tell like she had been talking to people you know like because these these were not this was not normal language for her and because there was a piece of me that's always kind of known I could snow my mom a little bit because she's my mom you know I know how to manipulate her right you know yeah. and uh <laughs> and I think every kid knows how to do that to a parent and um there was just something different, you know, and so that was really kind. And and honestly, like, it was the, really the first time in my entire life that I ever felt anything like that from her, you know, because my entire life it was always about, you know, her love for me and you know her wanting to see the greatest, you know, things come to my, you know, being and all that. And for and I knew that for her to be in a position where she had to even utter those words, something obviously was pretty bad, you know. And that really kind of it, it, it like starkly woke me up. Like as weird as that sounds, I know it sounds pretty soft, <laughs> but I don't care. I mean, it's the truth, you know. That that that's what it took for me. Like it took seeing my mother say something you know say say something even remotely like that because my whole life it had been the exact opposite 100 percent of the time it had always been in the other lane and the one time that it's not it stood out yeah you know pretty bad and it caught and there was just enough pause there for me to go what is wrong with me you know and 
it was supplanted. And, I, of course, I already had some doubt, you know, prior to all of this. Of course, I did. But I think that really put a big wedge in, you know, in, in, into my thinking a little bit about what I was doing. And, and I became pliable, I think, in that moment, really. Because I literally had said, well, what do you, well, what do you want me to do? And she said, well, glad that you asked. And she had a plan. And this was Sunday night. She goes, tomorrow night, <clears throat> John S. is going to come over. I, she said his last name. Yeah. John S. is going to come over here, and he's going to pick you up. He's going to take you to, a, to an AA meeting. And here's the funnier story about that. So this John S. character that she said character. was my insurance agent, who I just met last week, who I didn't know from Adam. All right, because for the longest time I had, you know, certain car auto insurance, and my, you know, the same people my mom had used. And then when I didn't have a license for a year prior to me getting sober, you know, prior to me getting this home incarceration deal, um, <laughs> um, yeah. So prior to that, I, you know, I'd always had uh, insurance with another company. Well, when I, part of the deal, like once I got you know put on home incarceration and they wanted me to do all that stuff, I had had my attorney work out. So look, I've already been without my license for a year. I need to, I need a license. If they want me to pay them money every week and all this stuff, I've got you know I've got a job I got to get to. Hey, a means I got to get to, you know. And so they got my they reinstated my license, you know, provided I was going to you know follow home incarceration and all that good stuff. So I, I got that, which means I had to get a you know a car. My mom gave me her old car. I had to get insurance. And so I'm doing all this the week right before I'm getting, you know, the same week that I'm getting, you know, or right before I'm getting my ankle bracelet put on or, or while I did that. And it was somewhere that weekend. I don't know. It was somewhere right before I got drunk. And uh, so I meet this guy, John. All right. And he's looking at my driving record. And, of course, I know what it says about me, you know. But there was no conversation, you know. He says we can – do the we can you know he can give me a policy okay great well i leave because i met my mom there well i didn't realize that after i had left that he had a whole conversation with her you know privately which basically you know stated you know like look you know anita uh, you're, it's clear to me that your son's got a drinking problem you know I think I can help, basically, can, is what yeah. he said. You know, If you want some help, I know how to get it. Yeah, and so he gave her some advice you know, about how she could help herself through the Al-Anon program. And then he also gave her some advice, I think, about uh, what he'd be willing to do you know, if the situation aroused um, where I you know, got in trouble to get, you know, or, or anything like that. Well, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know all this was happening. And it just so happens that same night, I go out and give her a good reason, you know, to have to drop the hammer the very next day because yeah. I go out and get drunk that night, you know. And so she rang him up and it's like, yeah, it happened. You know, and I think he basically told her, look, the worse it, the worse it is for him, the better, really, for us, because we like to take them when they're, you know, down Back and out. The matter is we got to have a certain level of pain before right. we're able to listen. And so, I mean, the, I mean, everything just kind of aligned that weekend, man, you know, to where it's like everything, like the tipping point was was there, you know. And, and that's why I really feel like it was a divinely inspired kind of a weekend for me. Um, and so, and what's, what is even more interesting is like, which is, which I've never remembered this until just now, which is so odd. Um, that while down there in Memphis, the, the week before i was supposed to come home and do this you know this uh, court appearance i had in my travels and doing door-to-door -door stuff i had met this religious couple who i guess looked at me as like a pity case you know and they started talking to me and usually when that would happen you know if you're wasting my time i gotta roll you know it's a numbers game baby you know i got sitting in time to listen to your job you got i gotta find out people listen to mine <laughs> and for some reason I just, I, I didn't fight it. I, I listened to them. And I was there for hours talking to these people. And I agreed to accept their invitation to uh, come back to their house that next weekend and have dinner with them. And they, were, they would take me to their church. I agreed to do that the <laughs> week before I drive. And so I, I, made, I set that up with them. And then as that week comes along, of course, I'm an alcoholic. I don't plan very well. 
I'm thinking, oh, shit, no, I got to go. It's Thursday. I got to drive to Louisville for my court case. I can't. I'm not going to be, be in town this weekend to do that church thing. You know, and so I don't know if that has something to do. I mean, I think it has to. I mean, I've never been open to any of that stuff before. But, the you know, but that yeah, time I was and then that yeah. weekend. So I think there was something working on me prior prior to my knowledge you know like i just i, I think i just that's just what i believe i believe that it was a divinely inspired i agree 100 percent, man i never do doubt that stuff anymore at yeah all. so even... when she told me so that morning so monday morning you know november 1st uh 2002 when she tells me you know this is what you're going to do or else and, uh, and it's going to be meet with your insurance agent who you just met you know and go to an aa meeting i'm thinking in my head what the fuck does my insurance company wanted to do with my alcoholism or i don't understand you know i was so confused i had no idea it was like a personal thing he was doing on the yeah. side for her i had no idea <laughs> you for you to have insurance like, you gotta thinking, start going to AM this meetings. don't this don't make sense to me at all this don't jive what the hell and so uh i had to have her explain it to me you know and when she did it, it then it made more sense but i remember it man so like so that was my I guess the bottom was kind of leading up to a moment, really, and so that so that night that you know, he he picked me up. We went to a, an eight o'clock meeting at the Token Club over in off Dutchman's Lane. I'll never forget it. Um, and we're walking in. It's a Monday night meeting, at eight o'clock, <clears throat> and it was the first time that I sat down in anything like that, and I just felt at home. Like I just did. Like I sat there quietly and I read the stuff on the wall, the twelve steps, the promises, the traditions. I read all that stuff quietly to myself. I'm looking around, I'm watching people and I'm seeing the laughter and I'm seeing people cutting up and joking with each other and you know, just stuff you know, like people were friendly and then I'm hearing the person open the meeting and reading what they say for their meeting and doing all that stuff and you know, and then people sharing and the topic that they introduced. I think it was a topic meeting in our discussion meeting and i just at one point i i caught i I noticed i realized that i had this humongous like permagrin on my face and i couldn't get it off you know what i mean that's how jazzed i was that like I felt like I was in the right place because, I mean, for all the – because for about 10 years, you know, I was trying to find – ever since I lost my best friend, really, from, you know, my own behavior that I pushed away, I had been slowly spiraling, sometimes quickly, but, you know, it was a downward spiral, consistently downward spiral. Um, And in between all of that, or while I'm on that roller coaster, you know, I'm trying to – make sense of it all you know there's there's moments in there where i'm trying to figure stuff out you know i'm not just you know blindlessly walking around like an idiot i mean i'm, I'm trying to you know seek and figure things out and but always coming up empty and always coming up short you know so arrive into a place you know like aa you know and and um just being you know for the first time like that was really my first experience ever sitting in an aa meeting and it was magical for me, you know, like it was, it, it, that really touched me that night. And it really told me who I was in a lot of ways, you know, uh, it scared me a bit. It did because, and for the next three or four months, you know, cause I went on home incarceration, you know, and of course I got permission to leave, you know, and I, and I would go every day. I went every day for about three or four months. Went to a meeting a day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have that story. I have that part of my story, too, because when you're on home incarceration, man, it's nice to get out of the house every day. Hell yeah, it is. Hell yeah. Um, but even when I was going, like, you know, it also scared me. Like, as, as, as much enjoyment that I got out of, like, finally, you know, that feeling of release of finally feeling like I found my people, I feel like I'm home, it also scared me because, it, you know, because in the back of my mind, or at the forefront, just in my head as well, you know, um, is that label you know that label of uh alcoholic you know i'm gonna get like i think i belong here but i think that means you know i have to admit that i'm an alcoholic and for me that meant that i was gonna have to admit that i turned out just like my father was despite all the the efforts that my mom put forth to 
to keep me from that. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. And I had a, and there's, there's been some not good stories that were told to me by my mother about my dad. And, you know, and so I guess growing up without him, you know, I'd kind of resided, you know, resigned him to the special place of, in my mind of, we don't really go there, but if I ever see him, I'm going to fucking kill him type mentality, you know? And so I didn't really have a positive, uh, uh, mental status about about him you know at that time early sobriety and um i didn't want to i didn't want to i didn't want to wear the same label that he had always been labeled as you know what i mean like there was a there there was a, a big part there was a big piece for me that fought that pretty hard um because i knew the stories i'd heard about him and i knew who i was up to that point and I didn't feel like I was anything like the, those stories that I'd heard with the share a label. Yeah. Like that, you know, like to me, sure. it was like a, 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 it was, that was a, almost a, a cut that was too unkind. You know what I mean? And so, so I fought fully giving in to this thing because of that. You know, I had to work that out for myself. And I finally got there. Um, but in, in between there, I ended up smoking a joint, you know, that, then I get a sponsor like a month after I smoked that joint and it was really useless. I took a few hits. It was, you know, it had been years since I'd smoked. And that's what I told myself. I was like, well, nobody in here talks about pot. See, here's, here's the other thing. This is kind of why I like it. You know, when people do share about drugs in, in AA, because of these meetings I was going to pot, you know, people weren't mentioning anything but alcohol. And so I literally, and of course me not knowing anything and not having a sponsor, not knowing any shit from Shinola, I didn't know, that it was not okay, you know, to be. It's just you just thought I could, I can't drink. I, know I just I can't, can't drink. drink. I'm here for drinking. You know, I do have a problem with drinking. It's clearly I've always had a problem with drinking, but other stuff I've Pot not had not a problem. Been my problem. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I can do that stuff as long as I don't drink. I'm good. You know, I can say I'm sober, and you know, I thought that was really how it was. Um, little did I, you know, so that's kind of so that's why I, so I smoked that joint, which was really lackluster. I, Ended up going home at like nine o'clock, falling asleep because it had been three years since I smoked, and it just tore me down. And uh, but anyway, so I get a sponsor like that, and like a month later, go through the steps, have this humongous transformation, and just shift in you know perspective galore, and then get all the way up to celebrate my first year of sobriety. Right, you know, my whole family knows my sobriety date. You know, two two one of o two, or no, eleven one of o two, and. Um, I was about to celebrate my first year, and luckily the men, the men's group that I was going to, the, uh, the Trinity group, uh, does this group retreat every year, and it just so happened to be the week it fell the weekend before celebration night of my birthday at our home group, and so I go down to it was a three day weekend deal, me and a bunch of people. We go down there, and of course, the sponsor that I have, you know, I've been sitting on this lie for nine months that I smoked this joint. Because somewhere in that transformation process of, like, going through the steps and, you know, and having this transformation, I figured out, like, something clicked. Oh, shit, you shouldn't have smoked that joint back then, <laughs> you know? Um well, hell, you've been lying about, you know, like you haven't told anybody about it. Kind of thing, you yeah. haven't been, yeah, you haven't been, you know, you haven't told anybody about it now. What are you going to do? And I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to tell my sponsor because I kind of figured I knew what he was going to tell me to do. And what he was going to tell me to do is change my sobriety date. And that's exactly the last thing I wanted to do because I didn't want to, you know, have to change my date with all my family and friends that was expecting. Then they're they going to know I was a fuck up, you know. And I was kind of tired of them knowing me Yeah, like here that. he is again. Right, you know. Especially when it was something that, like, especially, like, I think what pissed me off the most about it was because, it's not like I did it and deliberately was trying to hide it. I did it unknowingly. You know what I mean? Like I kind of unknowingly got high and was like, "Oh, you mean that doesn't like that that doesn't apply?" You know, like I just didn't know, and so that's what pissed me off the most. It's like, <sighs> kind of inadvertently led myself down the wrong road. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and I, I know it is different. It's not the same thing, but it just rings a bell to me of like when somebody maybe has a drink by accident or you know yeah. they didn't know it was alcohol or you know they right. have something something happens and they didn't you know uh 
But you know, you that's it's not the same thing. But if you really honestly in your heart wasn't intending to well, I was intending to get high for the effects of getting high. I just wasn't. But it's like you didn't know you were resetting your sobriety date. You didn't really know. The... I didn't know what that was going to do to my sobriety date right, at yeah. that time. Because I didn't think they were linked. Yeah. You know, because and, you it know, was my first time exposed is, to all this stuff. I just really didn't know. At some point later on, it started messing with you. Yes. It started so messing that with in itself is a problem. Yes. Right? That yep. became a <laughs> problem. You got it. You're on it. Yeah, you're on the right track. And so that's that's what became the loudest you know thing and you know for me was that lie you know and of course you know then i started feeling weird about it you know because it's a program of honesty you know you know all that stuff started kicking in and then it felt like you know well now you do know the truth and if you don't don't tell on it then you're surely going to get drunk you know and then all this stuff you're doing is just going to be wasted because you know you're setting yourself up and so i felt all this pressure you know but i didn't but also felt you know um, like I didn't want to say anything, and so that was the confliction. You know, I was like, I feel compelled, like I should say something, but I don't want to. <laughs> and so it was, a, you know. So I go into that 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 weekend, and this was my first retreat ever. And so it's kind of an interesting. So here's another God moment. Here's another, you know, God inspired uh weekend for me he likes to do that on weekends for some reason he <laughs> likes to, to get jam- real busy on the weekends yeah well with me is maybe he, maybe it takes the whole weekend to get through my dumb ass i don't know but uh so my first aa sponsor um bart m um i think i know him too yeah because i know john s yeah and, uh, matter of fact i'll just back he, john he's, s he's is, a don m sponsor is he mm-hmm. uh John S. is son is my insurance agent today. Oh, okay. I went to school with him. He grew up, John and that family grew up directly across the street from some cousins of my, my cousin, well, really, really close cousin. So I grew up with him. Uh, my uncle drank with John a lot when we were young, you know, and I saw that all the time. They would sit out in the driveway and set up a card table in the garage and play cards and their wives and all that. And I watched them drink the way they did right. back then when I was a little kid. And my uncle subsequently ended up dying at age 49, come home from work one day and sat down and and, and on the bed and, and, and died. Oh, wow. Uh, and he was a heavy smoker and a heavy drinker. And, uh, and and the body just gave up. Uh, and so I'm pretty sure I know that the other first sponsor, too. I, yeah. it's, I got to. That's a trip. Yeah. But you're from southern Indiana, ultimately. Yeah. So yeah. some of these same things are. So go ahead, Bart. Uh, yeah, that is cool to retreat. Got some of those same connections. Yeah, but so so Bart M. is my first sponsor. And he, uh, he had pre-bought. Cause these, these this retreat ticket thing was like pretty expensive even back then. I think it's even raised even more, but I think it was like a hundred and something, one hundred twenty bucks, you know, back then, and uh, for a three day stay, you know, and uh, he had pre bought his ticket and was planning on going, and then at the last minute, because he he was selling mortgage and real estate and I was selling real estate. Cause this time I'd changed jobs and started selling real estate, so we had, we kind of had that in common. He called me up and said, hey, uh, I'm not going to be able to go to the miniature treat this weekend. I pre-bought the tickets. I can't really give them back. Um, he said, but the clo- you know, me and my fiance are buying a house. The closing got scheduled for this, this, this Saturday. I can't go now. He's like, I'll give them to you. He said, were you going to go? I said, well, I was going to, but I didn't really have the money because of all the court stuff. And he's like, well, I'll donate it to you. Just promise me that you get something out of it. And of course, I was like, "Are you serious?" They're like, "Yeah, I'd love to go and hang out with those guys all weekend." I was like, "Cool, sure, yeah." And so that's how I went. You know, I went on my sponsor's, you know, vacant vacancy, yeah, right, yeah. and um, you know, and so that kind of piqued my interest, you know, because I was still trying to figure out how, next Tuesday, next Tuesday, I got to get, get either get up and accept a, a one year lie or tell the yeah, truth, right. and that was going to be a hard. Yeah. Hard truth, hard lie to tell. Absolutely, and a hard truth to tell in that room. There was like 150 people in there. I mean, it was going to be a hard deal in either regard. So I was nervous to say the least. And so I kind of took this, you know, this little retreat thing. That kind of, that kind of like got my little radar going. Huh? What's this? Is this? Is this a? Is this a way out? Is this a way? What is this? And so I kind of prayed to myself, you know. And of course, I was new with all this prayer stuff, but you know, it was the first time I was really working with all that. 
and I earnestly was, you know, was putting a lot of effort into it and earnestly wanted, you know, God to uh, give me some sort of a sign, some sort of a message. You know, that's what I was clamoring for, you know, when really I knew the right thing to do. I was just scared. To sh- I was just scared to death, you know, and so I kind of hid behind this. Give me a sign. Give me a sign kind of a thing. Right. And uh <laughs> And so the format for these little retreat deals, you know, Friday night, you usually get there, you have dinner and usually have a meeting and then you go to your rooms or hang out, whatever. Saturday, breakfast, meeting, you know, maybe a breakout session and then there's usually a break and then there's usually more meetings in the afternoon and then dinner and then another meeting and then, you know, and then Sunday there's usually a breakfast and then a meeting and then you're done. Everybody goes home. So... At each little interval, at each time that we're having any kind of a group thing, you know, I'm I'm praying and I'm asking for God for a sign, some sort of a sign, you know. And, so, and I wasn't getting nothing, wasn't getting nothing until the very last day. It was on Sunday. We have breakfast. We sit down for our meeting. And this is the last meeting. Like, we're going to start this meeting. It's going to end. And then we're all going home. And then I won't see these cats again until Tuesday night, which is in two days, to stand up there and either tell my lie or tell the truth, you know. And... I, again, I sat there quietly, you know, and, and prayed one last time, you know, God, if you want me to say something, you know, give me a sign. And um, when they open up the meetings, you know, and they usually say something to the effect of, you know, if anybody's having trouble staying away from a drink or drug and you want to raise your hand, you know, and speak on it now, go ahead. You got the floor. Somebody raised their hand and he stood up and there was a guy named Kevin M., I believe. And he stood up and he said, for the last year and a half, he said, for the last year and a half, I've been lying about my sobriety. Those are the first fucking words he said out of his mouth. <laughs> I, and nobody had said anything like that all weekend. And I, in fact, I hadn't heard anybody say anything like that all the way up that whole year coming too to that cool, meeting, going cool. to other meetings. And he, he never even finished that sentence and my hand was already in the air. Like, it just floated up there. Yeah, you just said, give me a sign. Okay, there it is. I mean, it was miraculous. Like I couldn't believe it. Like my, I don't. Like, my hand just floated up there. They got me on the list. He said what he had to say, and then I was next. You know, and I stood up and did the same thing. Of course, mine was a lot more. I mean, he was emotional, and of course, I was emotional too. I was bawling and crying because it was a powerful moment, and um, it told the whole story to the whole room. And it was weird because, like, I was visibly watching 15, 20 other men around me start to cry as well. I hadn't seen that before. Like, mm. I've never seen that happen. Yeah. And then even more odd than that was the guy that I ended up giving a ride to the meeting, he would ask me if I could give him a ride, rode with me. I, I didn't really know the guy too well. But apparently he got high that that weekend or like right before he got in the truck with me to come down here and i didn't even know <laughs> and so the three of us told told our little you know our little uh little uh, hiccups in our sobriety story and apparently i mean and people still talk about it today like that weekend and i don't i've heard about it i've heard that story yeah or, you know not from this not at the depth that you so just it was told powerful it. Heard it to a, me for sure because it meant a lot to me but apparently it was powerful for somebody. So I really do believe that, you know, God was there, you know, doing some serious work for, for cool, lots man. of us. Super cool. Um, and I really think, you know, that that saved me. I really do. I mean, I really think had I not had done that or had I not actually told the truth, and li- who knows where I would have been. I, mean, I, I don't think I would, you know, I think, th- I think that was pivotal. I think that was an important piece to my recovery, you know, getting honest like that and, and sharing and it taught me some things, you know, it taught me quite a few things. You know, it taught me the, the, the value of honesty and, you know, and then it's okay to, to tell on your secrets and it's okay to tell your lies, which is why I'm pretty open today and try not to keep any of that stuff because there's value in not, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. Anyway. That's a great story. That is yeah. a great story. Yeah. That's cool. I'd heard it uh, on a on a lighter you know not the depth that you just told it right uh, obviously it's yours so it's got a lot more depth when you when it comes true. out of you so that is a true 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 very very cool so then just from a standpoint so at that, that point what happened one. was you knew when you did that you knew when you smoked it so you really only reset your sobriety date for three months forward from then so like all yeah, of a sudden well, you went from having I'm, almost I'm, a year to having nine months again well i knew I think i understand your question 
You didn't reset your sobriety date to the day you're standing there. You didn't, you know, that No, I just, I changed my date to, because I had, because I had gone nine months, you know, like, because I had smoked that joint three months in and then got a sponsor like at month four and then worked the steps, no drinking, no drugging the whole time. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what I'm so, so you were sitting here on a year and now all of a sudden you have nine months. Right. I basically, yeah. So basically just had to tack on three months to my date. Yeah. Is what I did. And that's what, what we found. That's what that's really what we did because I knew. You just come up with a date that you knew was safe. Well, I knew the, I knew my release date was uh, what my home incarceration oh. ankle date was. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And it was, and I, I, and I was a little foggy on like, was it the next day or the day after? But you knew it was So I couldn't kind of remember if it was first or second. And so I just, I was like, well, I came in on the, I'm just picking a date. The actual day, if I'm off one day, doesn't matter. The fact that I'm making the gesture to change it yep. knowingly, right. yep. Yep. that's yep. the important. So I just stuck, I think that's so a really good point. You know, February I mean, 1, you know. So this is a safe date. I know it could have actually been February 2, February. but I don't know. Oh, I don't okay. care. So, yeah. you Who know, cares? Yeah. It doesn't matter. You right. know, I've, I've yeah, especially nine work. months down the road. I mean, what's it real hell right. matter? Make, I'm, I'm going to pick one I like to, that's going to be easy to remember. The important, th- <laughs> you know, the important thing already happened. The important thing was yeah. me telling on it. Yeah. The yeah. important thing is not the date itself. Yeah. You know, it's it's how I feel about the date, you know, and, and you know, so. So Bart was your sponsor at this retreat? Yeah, so Bart was my sponsor. Was, I guess he's sitting there with you while you listen. No, I remember he oh, wasn't yeah, there. he's not there. He wasn't there because that's, that's, right. that's how I was ticket. there. That's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, I got a lot out of it. And so... So you come home and tell your sponsor. <laughs> yeah, I don't come home and tell my sponsor. And, of course, he was, you know, as late as shit. You know, he was like, well, it sounds cool. like you did get yeah, a lot out of it. I'm really being honest. Yeah, I'm sure he got, you know, he was happy to death. He had that, no idea the level no of idea. what you were going to get out of that meeting no. or that weekend. No. And so... And it's, and he, he remained my sponsor pretty much the majority i want to say the majority of my second year too and then that's when i met christopher started working with him and then i think i started working with christopher for only like a month or so and then i hit my two-year mark and i'd asked christopher i was like hey why don't we let bart give me my two-year token because yeah. he's pretty much been here the right. whole time you can give me my three years so that's kind of how he worked and he was he, he obliged so that's so bart gave me my first two year my first two tokens and then Christopher's gave me the last, you know, 13, and he'll be 14 in the next month. Yeah. Well, I see John quite often. Uh, I oh, used to you? see Bart a little bit, and I see his vehicles running, rolling around. Yeah, uh, he's a good dude, man. Yeah, yeah, he is. And he was at, he was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I, I used to talk about like how when you walked into your first day of meeting and you, it made an impression on you. Uh, I'm almost 100% sure Bart was sitting in my very first day meeting out here in, in New Albany that one. Okay. And I do make it draw a little distinction because when I was uh, in my early, when I, I had two DUIs by the time I was 19 and had to do some uh, court ordered AA that I don't even remember, you know. Right. Uh, I don't even, so I don't even like, even though those were not my first AA meetings, even though they were, you know uh-huh. what I mean? I count that one when uh-huh. I came in. I guess I, what I say is I came in with a third tradition type of. Uh-huh. Uh, a my first third tradition AA meeting when I came in with the desire to stop right uh, was then and I'm Bart was in it and then John actually is a still a friend see him quite often and and my dad and him have coffee probably every morning oh do they and uh, like if dad there was a time a while back where dad was uh, sick for a little bit you know and John will call you know he's like what's up with your dad I didn't see him at Burger King this morning or whatever. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, so he's actually still, you know, uh, a part of a part of my life. I see him and hear from him on a semi regular basis, and that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I love I love John. He's such a, a, a gentle guy, sweet guy. He's got a cool voice. Yeah, he does. He's, he's, I mean, he's got a voice. very unique, interesting voice. I love it. Yeah, he sure but, does. Uh, yeah, yeah. He just he just he means well. You know, like there's I've always enjoyed his you know, energy. He, I remembered that when I was a kid, the way those guys used to drink. Oh, did you? Uh, John and, and <laughs> yeah. my uncle. Yeah. And um, so when I'm bouncing around and I'm doing this, you know, like that first like that first meeting, I remember having a severe case of fear that I'd see somebody in that meeting I knew. Right. I was in my hometown. Uh, I was at a church I was going to. Uh, I was going to this church. 
Yeah. Uh, I, and I actually, I, I, I do remember putting the car in reverse and then put and start to back out and then put the car back in the parking spot again and back in and back out and back in and back out a few times uh-huh. of wanting to leave, but knowing I shouldn't, that, that I should come in here and go and, and walk in. Yeah. And I remember, I do remember like, you know, like kind of like the almost a, forcing myself just fuck it just get out of the car and go in yeah you know, you know? <laughs> and, and i and i did um <laughs> but when i'd run when i first ran into john you know he didn't even you know he had been a lot of years and i knew who he was yeah and introduced you know so now i'm okay right right and now i'm wanting i'm loving it when i see somebody that i know you know, just not too long ago, I was scared to death. I'd see somebody I knew in AA. Yeah. And then now I love it when I see somebody I know. Yeah. And I had no idea because he's a snowbird. He uh, goes stays in Florida in the winter. Yes, now. he does. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so he's probably there now. Uh, I would assume so. Yeah. It's yeah. being uh, mid January. Yeah. 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 I think he's probably down there. That's yeah. a cool story. Very cool story. Yeah. So that takes us up to the first year. We got 15 more to go. <laughs> yeah, we're an hour and 40 minutes no i'm kidding um yeah so i don't know how long we want to keep this rolling or not so that is a, that's a pretty good pretty good while yeah yeah but I mean, there's other stuff i mean i don't know I yeah could, and, I you could, know, we I can could always keep talking yeah we could keep talking or we could uh you know and it doesn't mean that uh i like have guests back again you know there's more story to tell and you don't necessarily have to marathon at all you know we can like uh we could uh you know that's pretty cool the <laughs> You, you 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 did tell us a lot did i yeah and uh and but like and but what's the amazing part of it is is all that you know is really just brought you up to the first year of recovery you know to like or maybe two you know we got to that that you know and that's a whole lot you know so it's probably being at 16 years there's another 14 years of of actual recovery uh, uh yeah, stacked yeah, in on in top there. of that story there's lots of, yeah there's other layers of things i mean more deeper level kind of stuff i guess and more stuff with my dad and you know of course right getting him. married and having kids and running the business all that stuff but you know there's there's other things yeah um so i could come back or i could just get you know, the clip my, note version i'll tell you or, just uh from sitting here my gut is telling me that that is a cool place to stop this one uh well, i'll tell you another thing it. and i don't really know for sure but like people are listening to this Mm-hmm. And you'll to sit and listen to an hour and a half or yeah, almost a two a, hours a deal. or something. Yeah, that's uh, an investment. I, I start beginning to be like, you know, once I start getting to close to that two hour mark, I feel like I'm stretching people's uh, attention spans pretty well. <laughs> okay. Although I do believe that this is the kind of time frame it takes to do this kind of thing. That when you're up behind the, at, at the podium and that, you're given yeah. a real condensed version of what's up. Yeah. When you're up there and like in this format, we can actually get into some depth and we don't have to be restrained by the clock and yeah. and and actually get some Yeah, this is the first time I've ever out. done this, so this is uh It's fun, ain't it? Fir- well, yeah, it's the first time I've gone obviously this long and not gotten as far in, you know, through my story. Cuz usually if I'm in a meeting, you know, and I and I'm looking at that clock and yeah, you got cranked through it. Well, and I'm seeing, okay, shit, I got 15 minutes. I got to get sober here. Yeah, all right, so, uh, yeah, so all that was bad. Yeah. <laughs> the next five years, pretty much more the same. And, you know, uh, all right, so my sobriety date. Let's start from there and let's move forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're fast forward and through all that. Yeah. And I'm sure the same thing. Uh, well, um, you're the first person to sit down that's had any extended amount of recovery, too. Oh. Uh, so, so far, and I don't, you know, that's not planned or wasn't anything going on, but most right. of the guys have been like uh, Chase and Travis and those guys and Shane. Shane just got two. So, uh, Chase and Travis are in their second year of recovery. Okay. Uh, Eric sat down the, just a couple of nights ago and he's uh, in his, in a little bit past his year and a half. So, uh, you got a lot more story to tell, you know, and, and, so that yeah. would make sense. You know, I could come that, back that, and, uh, and, and pick up from, um, you know, I think year that'd be one, a cool way to end of it. year one, yeah. year year two uh, up till now. Because there's, there's lots of other stuff, you know, lots of stuff about my dad and, and how all that kind of came about. And yeah, so, so like uh, this could be so far like part one is Brandon growing up and getting sober. Yeah. And then part two is life in recovery Life recovery for me and, yeah uh, that's cool we can do it thing man um, so uh, yeah we'll reschedule plus uh, uh another thing and you you used the restroom before uh I, i'm gonna have to get a bucket or something next to me uh, <laughs> 
to be able to do this. Well, man, I, I do I appreciate <laughs> you coming by, but that's what well, let's make that a plan. We will uh, we will do a part two. Uh, I'll do a little wrap up here because I do want to make sure uh, people know that they can go to spiritualunderground.org. Dot org. It's just like it's spelled spiritual underground. Org. We got some show notes. We got pictures of people who have been in here talking, so you can like put a face with the name. Um, and also, there's a page there that uh, if you got any comments, any feedback you want to send, there's an email address on a contact page that you can contact me directly. And uh, uh, I'm open to uh, criticism or compliments, either one. Uh, or if you're local here and you want to be, uh, if you want to be on this podcast and tell your story, uh, I'm, uh, that's that's the way you get a hold of me for doing that too. So, uh, once again, man, I, I love you to death. It's uh, the original Juice Man <laughs> in the studio, and we got to hear where that uh, where that term originated. And that's uh, that's golden in itself, man. Uh, we will sign off. Uh, what's Christopher says, peace out. Peace out. Peace out.